Um, our next and last presenter, last but not least, is Kevin Liu. I wanted to say something special about Kevin Liu because he's such a trooper. You all are, but he's the very last one to go. This is the last presentation of RSI. All he wants to do is sleep. I know it. Um, you've been hanging here for so long. Um, so, yeah, great work. Anyway, his project is really cool. Um, it's about number fields generated by torsion points on elliptic curves, and his mentor was Mr. Chung Ho Lo. Hung Lo, sorry. Good afternoon. So uh, this summer, I had the privilege of studying elliptic curves. And elliptic curves are arguably the most interesting curves in all of mathematics. <laughs> so the most famous example is uh, Andrew Wall's proof of Fermat's last theorem, which did use elliptic curves. And the Fermat's last theorem had previously been unsolved for 300 years. And it is possibly one of the most famous uh, conjectures of all time. And today, there is a millennium problem called the bertrand swinnerton dyer conjecture. Uh, is about elliptic curves. And if you solve it, you will win a million dollar prize. So this is a very uh, rich field of study. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> and so what even are elliptic curves? Well, at the core, elliptic curves are uh, smooth curves in the xy plane defined by certain types of cubic equations. Uh, the most simple example is a cubic equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So here are some examples of elliptic curves of this form. You can see. There are several different shapes this may take. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that these are all symmetric about the x-axis. This will be important in my next part. Because one of the really cool things you can do with elliptic curves is you can kind of add points. So let's say I have two points, a and b, on this elliptic curve. And I want to like, find their sum. So how this works is that first, I will draw the line through a and b. And since an elliptic curve is a cubic curve, uh, the line should intersect the curve at three points. So we'll call this third point of intersection C. And since this elliptic curve is symmetric about the x-axis, when I reflect C over the x-axis, I'll get a new point D that is still on the elliptic curve. And this point D is our sum A plus B. And what this procedure does is create an additional operation that behaves exactly like normal addition. So in particular, it's commutative and associative. And if we work in the projective plane, so we'll introduce a point at infinity in the vertical direction. What this means is you can consider a point that's so high up that it lies on every vertical line. And we call this point O. And if we introduce this point O, this o, point O becomes the identity for this addition operation. Also, uh, another cool fact is that when A, B, and C are collinear, A plus B plus C is the identity O. In particular, the points C plus D here is our identity O. So we have inverses, and the points on this elliptic curve form a group. So I, I looked at special points uh, on elliptic curves called torsion points. And what torsion points are are points where if you add them to them themselves enough times, you will get the identity O. So here's just a simple example. So I claim that this point P right here is a four torsion point, uh, i.e. 4P equals O. So we want to add this point P to itself. Well, what does that even mean? Because I said we want to draw the line through the two points we want to add. So we want to somehow draw a line that goes through P twice. So we can think of this as taking another point Q, drawing the line through P and Q, and making Q approach P. And what this does is the line through P and Q will approach the tangent line to the curve at P. Um, once we draw this tangent line, it intersects over here. And this point is already on the x-axis, so when we reflect it over, we get the same point back. So this point is a point P plus P, or 2P. So now we want to find 3P. So we draw the line through P and 2P. Again, the tangent line can be thought of intersecting the curve twice at P. So the third intersection is just P again. We reflect it over, and we get this point 3P. And now we find P plus 3P. So we draw the line through them, and it's vertical. So that means that the third point of intersection of this line with the curve is our point at infinity O. And so P plus 3P, or 4P, is our point at infinity O. And just as another demonstration to show the associativity of this uh, addition operation, we can also show that 4P is identity by adding 2P to itself. So we draw the tangent line at 2P, and it's vertical. So we'll pass through the point at infinity O. And again, we get that 4P equals O. So what can we do with these uh, torsion points? So Let's take a prime power, p to the n, and consider all the p to the n torsion points on this elliptic curve, and we allow the coordinates to be any complex numbers. 
So what we're going to do with these coordinates is use them to uh, form a structure called a number field. And what a number field is, is just some uh, set of numbers where you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers and stay within the number field. So what we're actually going to do is adjoin these coordinates to the rational numbers. What that means is we look at the rational numbers, and we look at all our coordinates, and we find all the numbers that we can get by adding, subtracting, and multiplying any combination of these. And so we'll call this number field kn. And to make this all more concrete, suppose we have an elliptic curve defined by the equation y squared equals x cubed plus x. And we can show that the two torsion points on this elliptic curve are the identity o, uh, the origin 0, 0, i comma 0, and negative i comma 0. And when we adjoin all these coordinates to the rational numbers, uh, we get the field q adjoint i, which is simply the set of all complex numbers such that both the real and imaginary parts are rational. Okay. So one interesting property of number fields that we want to study is the class number. So uh, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic states that any integer can be uniquely decomposed in a product of prime. So everyone knows 6 equals 2 times 3. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells us there's no other way to write 6 as a product of primes. But what if we work in something other than the integers? So let's look at z adjoin root negative 5, which is just a set of all numbers of the form a plus b times the square root of negative 5, where a and b are integers. So is there an analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic in this ring? The answer is no. So we see we have two different ways to write 6 as to factor 6. And these are fundamentally different factorizations in that none of these four numbers can be decomposed further into a product of members of this ring other than like 1 or negative 1. So we have no fun, like analog of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And what the class number measures is how far we are from having any sort of unique factorization. So in the integers, since we do have unique factorization, the class number is just 1. Uh, in this example, we don't, and the class number is 2. And in general, the higher the class number, the further you are from having unique factorization. So one tool we're going to use to study the class number of the field kn is a, called the Galois group. So let's just consider any number field k. And we're looking at the automorphisms of this field k. What that means is we want maps from this field k to itself that preserve the addition and multiplication operations. And in addition, we require that this map send every rational number to itself. So let's again look at the field q adjoint i. Uh, we have exactly two such automorphisms, the identity, obviously, and complex conjugation, because the sum of two conjugates is the conjugate, and the product of two conjugates is also the conjugate. So when we look back at our field Kn that we defined earlier, the way that we define this field allows us to consider elements of this Galois group as two by two matrices in the general linear group uh, with entries in the integers modulo p of the n. Uh, what that means, instead of looking at like, numbers as integers, we're just looking at the remainders when they're divided by p of the n. And the reason this is helpful is because instead of having to look at maps from this field we don't really understand to itself, we can just look at two by two matrices, which are a lot easier to work with. Okay, So we use this to say something about the class number of kn. So here's a previous result by Hironucci, which Given that this Galois group contains all the matrices in this general linear group, uh, they're able to obtain a bound on the class number in terms of the exponent n and the rank of the elliptic curve, which is just a number associated with the group of points on the elliptic curve. And what we were able to do was say, OK, instead of having to contain all the matrices in this general linear group, you will consider only the diagonal matrices in this general, general linear group. And diagonal matrices are those where uh, all entries off the main diagonal are 0. So if we only look at the diagonal matrices, it turns out we can still say something about the class number of this field kn. And I'll give an example to demonstrate the significance of the results. So here's an elliptic curve. And let's say p equals 3. And we look at our field k1. It does not, the Galois group does not have all the matrices in the general linear group. So the previous result cannot tell us anything about the class number uh, of this field. However, it does contain all the diagonal matrices in the general linear group. So uh, our result tells us that the class number of k1 is definitively divisible by 3. And since class numbers are notoriously difficult to compute in general, this is a very significant result to get any kind of constraint on this class number. So I'd like to thank my mentor, uh, Chen Hong Lo, for introducing me to this topic and uh, being very helpful in guiding me on this research. Professor Andrew Sutherland, who uh, originally suggested the topic, 
uh, head mentor, Dr. Tanya Kovanova, and my tutor, Dr. John Rickert, for helping me with my paper presentation. Finally, RSI, CE, MIT, and my sponsors for giving me the opportunity uh, to come to RSI. I had a blast. It was a time of my life. Thank you very much. OK, are there any questions? It's OK if there aren't, because I was ready for this. Because Oh my god, there's a question, Will. Update, I no longer have a question. <laughs> OK, so the question was, is, does the class number kind of describe the number of like ways to factor something? Uh, the answer is no, it's a bit more complicated than that. <laughs> so it's like not something I'd be able to describe in a short presentation. <laughs> like, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you say a bit how you came up with the insight that led you to this? So, and just like kind of briefly outline the general idea how you can uh, show either of these results ideas. You can define another field, number field LN, which contains KN. And what you do is you look at the degree of this field LN over KN, which is just a measure of, measure of how much bigger the field LN is than KN. And you can relate this to the class number by using something called the Hilbert class field, which like also defines a bigger field than KN, and the degree is related to the class number. So when you do that and you find the degree of LN over KN, you can say something about the class number of KN. Um, Sanjay. Um, so can we go back one slide? How exactly do you associate the elements of the log group with the elements of uh, GL2 VCC? Okay. So how do you associate uh, the elements of Galois group with these matrices? Um, so the idea is that the P of the N torsion points um, as a group are actually isomorphic to the direct sum of this integers modulo P of the N and itself. So the idea is that if we look at the automorphisms of KN, these can also be thought of on morphisms of these p of the n torsion points. And these are just going to be like matrices over that uh, vector space. I saw Franklin raise his hand a minute ago. Yeah. How are the ingredients of the mirror proof different from that of Hiranucci's? Okay, so how is my proof different from Hiranucci's? Well, the answer is that the outline is the same, but the details of finding the degree of the extension are somewhat different. Oh, yes. So other than winning a million dollars, can you elaborate on the <laughs> practical application? OK. <laughs> so, uh, so the question was, what are some more practical applications of elliptic curves? Well, so there is one field where elliptic curves are very useful, and that's cryptography. Because there are cryptographic schemes that utilize elliptic curves, and uh, there's something called Lentris algorithm, which is an algorithm that uses elliptic curves to factor large integers. And it's one of the best algorithms known for this problem. And factoring large integers is a very big problem in cryptography. Well, problem depending on how you look at it. But the point, <laughs> like, the point is that the study of elliptic curves can be applied to like, more practical things. All right, um, I'm not going to torture you guys too much longer. I will let you go home, eat dinner, except for us. We get to go and eat dinner and also listen to a talk so you can't go to sleep yet. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much, Kevin. You did a great job.